Blake's. Like, hey, Scoob, did you hear Nikki Blake is hosting a Scooby-Doo panel? No. Yeah. Like on today's Scooby-Doo episode, Scooby-Doo and Shaggy meet Nikki Blake. Yeah, in a Scooby panel. <laughs> like, we need to get this puppy started. Yeah, okay. Nikki Blake, take it away, Scooby-Doo. <laughs> On today's Scooby Panel episode, Nikki and Wendy meet voice actor and teacher Pat Fraley. Okay, how do I look? You look great. great. Yeah, yeah, that's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Nikki and Wendy. Yes. <laughs> and Nikki, you've got long blonde yeah. hair. Yeah. Like I said, when I started going gray. I said, wait, I think I'll make my hair blonde. No, wait, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I was to a towhead as a kid. Now, do you, do you know what towhead toe means? It's the top of the wheat, that T-O-W, and it's okay. white. My right. best friend uh, from high school has gone from toe to toe. So I go, you look the same as in uh, high school. Good. Good job. <laughs> My hair looks okay. Oh, yeah. Looks fantastic. I Honestly, I, Rod Stewart would be jealous right now. I know. Well, you know, it's all genetics, but shh. <laughs> I mean, you have white hair, which may be a little gray. I don't know. <laughs> but it's lovely. It's Nikki. <laughs> So look at you, you have Scooby-Doo behind you and on the wall, and my goodness, was I shocked when I came from uh, Australia and Seattle and down, and I won't go into it too much, but uh, my first job was Scooby-Doo, and they've been going for 10 years. This was 79, they were going in 69. Yeah. I'm not telling you anything new. <laughs> it's really cool that, that Scooby Doo was your first job. Like that's so I know. Cool. Well, beyond cool, I'll tell you about it. You know, because <laughs> I was watching Hanna Barbera when I was nine years old in fifty eight. Yeah. Same guys. <laughs> Dude, oh, dudettes. I got to work with all the original people in Jessens, Flintstones, Huckleberry Hound, right at the end of their careers. And so I was uh, fortunate to be able to work with all those people when they started, when they were ending. And I was beginning, I was 30 by the time I got to town. Now you said right, did you say right? Or just mouthed it. Oh, I think. <laughs> oh, good, because I read lips. See, <laughs> you went. You went. <laughs> I grew up around the deaf. My grandfather taught the deaf and blind. Oh, okay. Deaf mainly for years before I met him, and my mom would go uh, late at night. She'd go, Which means come in and eat, you dumb guy. <laughs> yeah. And we, I half signed and half wrote or half spoke my whole life. I, I didn't know. Yeah. But uh, she would sign stuff. And uh, that's where I learned how to act from the deaf. Wow. So, and they're so exaggerated, right? When they mm -hmm. go, I didn't know better. So uh, I was great at theater. I was a little exaggerating. Check off, the pilot light went out. <laughs> I couldn't be normal. Yeah. So as it turned out, and I didn't know, after 50 plays, I was better at uh, uh, voiceover. As Brett Garrett would say, can you give them a little more? They can't see you. <laughs> oh, that so was great. 
perfect for cartoons, right? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you started voice acting in 1979 and your first role was in Scooby-Doo Goes Hollywood. How did you get into voice acting? Let's go back a little bit. I went through Whitman College, got there in 69 for my two last years, then went to Cornell, got an MFA in acting, got out in 73, didn't know what I was going to do, didn't want to walk the streets of New York. So I had figured out how to emigrate to another country. Now, you couldn't get into Britain, green card, no. Australia, they read, they speak uh, English, sort of. And uh, so I went there, got there in 74, early 74, and learned about voiceover and did a couple jobs, got paid. Now, I was in the middle of a session and the uh, engineer said, oh, we like you. And I'm like, why? They go, oh, you're so big. We can't get the other actors to be that big. I'm like, uh, okay. All right. And I'd fail to check off and fail at this and was good on stage a little more, right? I said, right. I, I think I probably need to go into cartoons because they, they're kind of big. So within two or three years, I went from Seattle down to LA and got into Scooby-Doo. Now, I gotta go back. I got married February 14th of 1979. I was in LA by March of 79. So new wife, new kid on the block. I'm 30 years old. I go to the producer, Don George, who my wife and I had met in Tahiti on vacation, right? And he said, look, look, if you stop doing Paul Lynn impressions, I'll audition you. Yeah, okay, right. So uh, he, I got down there and I said, well, here I am. And he went, really? <laughs> and so he hired me to do a little teeny guest shots on Scooby-Doo Goes Hollywood. Now, Wendy, Variety, which was the uh, magazine of the era, you know, mm -hmm. that was it. Variety was the trade mag, right? Yes. They uh, auditioned it. Uh, no, they uh, reviewed it. Scooby-Doo, doo-doo. It was <laughs> so bad. And you know what? I, wow. I played a couple roles. And then I went on to do Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo. Mm-hmm. Same thing, you know, a little add a little dog. I think Frank Welker ended up doing the dog, who was Fred in Scooby Doo. Always, as Lou Scheimer would say, then he'd say, You know, Frank Welker could do anything except humans. <laughs> now he got better, okay, he got so much better, but he was really kind of, Hey, Velma, where are we going now? He was very really kind of stiff. He had started Scooby-Doo as Casey Kasem as Shaggy and Don Messick as Scooby-Doo uh, 10 years earlier yeah. when I started college. But I was trained in a while, you know, I was in there and the villains were all uh, guests, uh, Bob Holt and you know, other people. They guessed in and guessed out. So... Later, as I went through this, I asked Don, I said, Don, after I got a career, he called a, uh, by the way, an agent, the best in, in Hollywood at the time, Herb Tannen, who just died. And he said, Herb, I got a guy. Uh, can I bring him over? Yeah, yeah. He send him, send the demo. Well, I went in there with the demo in my hand, like, huh, right? And I got hired by Herb Tannen. Well, I didn't think about it, but a producer from Hanna Barbera calls an agent and said, this guy's good. Come on. So I got, he said, come on in tomorrow and I'll sign you. Well, I went home to my wife and I went, this is too easy. There's some wrong thing here. I went in the next day and I went, look, Herb, it's too fast. It's too, and he went, hey, you'll be making $30,000 in a year. 
And I thought, $30,000? My goodness, it was like not beyond 30. That was enough. And I signed with him. So later on, I talked to Don Jurich, who produced that and other shows on Anna Barbera. I said, why don't you keep hiring me? He goes, well, you brought this new wife down to L.A., and I was kind of guilty. <laughs> and I went, well, good, because I got a career after about three years from other people. Now, here's the trick, and I'm looking at Wendy. Nikki's up there. Now, here's the trick. Uh the other actors, Bob Ridgely, uh, John, well, a lot of guys, you know, Jody Gerber, Alan Alpine, they were in their saddle. They go, hey, Pat, let's go to lunch. Well, I'd save my money in Seattle working in, in uh, advertising. And I had about 10 grand, which is like 100 now. And uh, uh, they tell them, let's go to lunch. Because they'd only do morning sessions, four hours, and afternoon. That was it. Bam. Other actors waited dishes. You know, were a guy. You know, they worked in a restaurant. And I, and, but I'd save my money. So I said, yeah, fine. So I'd have lunch with them. And after about two years, and I'm making a little, but I had saved it, right? Um, they be called who do we get to do the duck with a list oh get Braley. you know 200 pounds scottish duck with a list which i'm gonna be like this and i could do anything you know you tell me what to do and i do it and they thought i was part of the game you know i'm 30 years old they were 50 right but they thought oh yeah Braley's run they didn't know i was not working so after three or four years, I got a reputation and got a career. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a long answer to a short question. Nick. We like <laughs> no. long answers. We like yeah, to we hear do. stories. We're good. Yeah, well, you know what? <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, it's it's like a, good to hear long answers. So you got to work with all of the original act voice actors and, yes. and all that. Um, did you ever think that at some point you would be on their level? I mean, you're no. amazing. Okay, People two, know you and you're just yes. amazing. I'm the guy. Why? <laughs> I'm still alive. But <laughs> let's go back to, I walk into Hanna-Barbera, my first job. I got a tie on in a blazer, really unhip. And I hear some voices, and it's Don Messick, who did Scooby-Doo and all sorts of other things, and Dawes Butler, the greatest voiceover of all time. Now, Mel Blank got another, uh, got press. He was very dy dynamic. Dawes Butler was the best actor. Huckleberry Hound, Yogi Bear. Oh, I, I couldn't name more. So I started watching him on the... Uh, Rough and Ready show in 1959. I was eight years old, right? And uh, I, I hate misses to pieces. Yeah, some cat, cat with Trixie and Pixie, the mice. I, I don't know what it was, but I watched it Saturday morning. I walk into Anna Barbera, 30 years old, six to eight years of acting training, and I hear those voices. I was shocked. And Frank Walker started Scooby-Doo's in 69. So those guys, Messick and uh, Dolph Butler, had been going 20 years. Yeah. And I, now, bear in mind, Dawes uh, Butler was 4 foot 11. He was not the size, <laughs> you know. Uh, and uh, Don Messick was a tall man, but singularly not a attractive guy, you know, not a cool looking guy, but they had work. So I walk in to this illusion, the shower of all my days, as Dylan Thomas would say, and uh, work with him. Now, there was a second part to this 
wasn't. And uh, Nikki, I had no idea that I would have a career. In those days, it was Saturday morning, right? And you do like 12 shows, 16, you were done. It was like a uh, fruit picking. You know, you get a season, bam, you go pick the fruit, you don't work for the rest of the year. So that was the way it was. 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, way, whoa. He man by filmation hit the ground. What was it? Monday through Friday. It wasn't a Saturday morning. And uh, they killed the market. They had a 7.5 share or something like that. I don't know. They killed. From that time on, we had a 62 to 64 episode buy. And they had so many. I mean, we'd go in. We wouldn't even audition. We'd go, yeah, get Pat. He'll do that. Get to, I talked to a Neil Ross at one point because we had shows together. He's my age. Sounds like I am. And I said, how are you doing? He goes, well, uh, I'm bad. What? He goes, well, I have nine shows this week. And I can't remember the characters. <laughs> I've got a cassette. I went, listen to it. You'll be fine. And fa In fact, I had one day where I auditioned for the Littles, the, the uh, Turtle. Wow. You know, and uh, uh, a Smurf. So I was really high. And another character. I did the same voice for all three shows, ABC, CBS, NBC, and I got them all three. Now, good news, they never watched each of those programs. So I got away with it. But, you know, we were running light. Even the Michael Bell and the more uh, versatile, uh, they had great separation between characters, had trouble. But like I asked Michael Bear, what do you do? And he said, well, I'm sort of like Mr. Potato Head. I change your nose, I change your ears, I change your eyes, no problem. And here's what happened. And only God's plan can do this. When I was in Australia, I taught vocal dynamics at a, a University of Flinders. I was living in Adelaide. And I they knew I did characters on, uh, you know, uh, commercials and stuff. So I'd go in and they go, well, what'd you do today? Well, I, I was in a rep company and then I did a commercial and now I'm here. Well, what'd you do? And I'm like, well, Walter Bannon. Ralph Walter Brennan. I'll give us a taste. Well, he's high and he goes lower. No, no, mate. Give us a taste. Well, he's low and then he goes high and he has a soft dialect like Connecticut much faster in the winter. Oh, yeah. Thank you. So they opened up me breaking down the character voice to its elements. Nobody had done it. To this day, they really have not done it to the six elements of a character voice. So cut to 1974, 75, to about uh, 79, 88, 83, 10 years later. I was doing the same thing as great uh, folks in uh, cartoon voices were doing, but I defined it. I broke it down. And I've always had a passion for performing and teaching. So I taught and performed all my life. And it, they both fit, praise God. And now I'm old, and so I I'm, I teach more than perform. But this, that's okay. COVID, you know, knocked us out of the saddle. Yeah. Yeah. We can't. Last cartoon show I did, which is an ensemble cast, we had 12 people in one room. You had to be careful to hear your cue, right? They were all, we were all lined up. Last one I did uh, was one person. Dude, it was like a video game, which is always one person. It was kind of a little creepy. <laughs> so is that normal that several people would record together? And was that so that you could get the dynamic off of each other and, and like feed off of each yes. other? Yes. Nikki, yes. In fact, you were in a room 
and with the majority of the cast, some were wild, but somebody would would uh, cover them, so they had the timing right up the line, and it was normal. And you know, it's like theater. It was sort of like, what do they give me now? Oh, you know, if I said to you, uh, you just react, Nikki. Nice hair. Thank you. Okay, now let's go back to uh, Nikki. <laughs> Nikki Gira. Okay, now I'm going to do a different line. Nice hair. Thank you. <laughs> you see how you changed? That's the way we will work, depending on how the, what they'd give you. And uh, now, what the heck? You know, I did a video game, and I was so delighted because I was going to work with uh, an actress. Gosh. Uh, on turn, uh, she was on Nats Landing, a blonde. Um, gosh, I can only remember her daughter, Vanessa Marshall. She was married to Mark, but her last name was Marshall. So I was so delighted because she was in her 60s. No, you know, to an old couple talking. She wasn't there. So I had to imagine how she would put in her performance. Who knows? I never saw the game, but it's guesswork. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you, you try to be loud and evocative and important, but who knows? And so that was the way. It was ensemble-driven cast and no more. Plus, I used to teach with the 12, 10 people there, get them in a studio, a private studio, feed them. They go to the bathroom, come back, I'd say mic, another mic, whatever, right? No, you can't have them in. You can't feed them. They can't go to the bathroom. They have to clean up every time, whatever. And what? What about mics? So I teach at home and I do home study courses and do well because people know who I am. And uh, that's what I do. I don't do Zoom even, because I'll tell you what, if you really want to get into it, the acting and performing side, our greatest enemy, as I told Nikki, was, is fear. I can't see it. So I can't help them in that area. I can be encouraging stuff and it gets a little better, but I don't know. So I do the best I can. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I have many many uh, tricks, techniques, and methods, and mindsets that I'm okay. I can deliver those and smooth other, other ones and other uh, performers. So you teach people not to have that fear. How do you go about doing that? Well, the only way you can de deal with fear is to calm them down. You know, say, say nice hair again. Pat, you have great hair. Good. Let's try. <laughs> let's try that. The way you said that, a little sarcastic, a little bit. <laughs> Pat, you have great hair. More. <laughs> See, this is the the fear. Like <laughs> I can. I know, feel that but I'm because... <laughs> bringing you along. Give me a little more sarcasm, nice hair. You have nice hair. Perfect. <laughs> you see what I did? I brought you along. Sometimes we have, uh, they do the homework and I get to take three. Good, but let's go a little further, or a little less, you know. And that's what you have to teach when you're not in front of them. Yeah. You know, when I was at Cornell, I was uh, in getting my master's with Bill Sadler. He was in the class. In fact, we'd sit next to each other and see somebody doing a sketch and we'd hear the professor go, what are you thinking? You're doing that Jew thing. What are you doing? And Bill would turn to me or I would turn to Bill and go, well, I guess I'm not going to do that. <laughs> it was so freaking mean. Yeah. And I thought to myself, maybe I didn't think. I just knew it. I thought I'll never teach that way. That's more about teaching than learning. Yeah, you can get through it 
And the worst part is being uh, shined on. Yeah, good, honey. That's good, next. No, I don't do that, but I'm forthright. And I'm encouraging. And that's why I've, I've had a career. Uh, and I have a career because I hit that right in the middle. I deal with fear, but I'm not an I'm not an ass. Yeah. So you voiced sixty five characters in the TV series Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah. And obviously, those characters are different. How long did it take you to be able to learn that? separating characters and and be comfortable with that i knew it i knew it from uh australia as i mentioned i'm breaking the breaking the character voice down to its six elements so i can mix it mix and match and in those days fred wolf was the producer and he fired the director Stu rosen who's gone now because he did it on a sun Saturday, and he cast himself in six or five characters, lead characters. In those days, a contract was good for three. Then you get another contract for more. So he, that irritated Fred. And I did a movie with Fred beforehand. You remember when I talked about I started? Well, Barry Gordon and I had done a movie, so he knew who I was. So he called me and he said, okay, come on in. Uh, I want you to do this role called Crank. And so I got this script, and it was Crank, one character, not the other ones. You know, I would do those. I I found out later, but Crank, an evil, bodiless blurb of a man, villainous, evil, but funny. I went, oh, God, what am I going to do? Pat, okay, give me two minutes. So I ran through... Pitch, pitch characteristic, rhythm, tempo, and mouth work. One by one, I kind of built my audition. Who knows? It was like uh, spaghetti, throw it against a wall and what sticks is good, right? So uh, I went in and did, well, it's good to hear from you. What do I get from surrounding my Stop with idiots. So I talk backwards. Something I learned in fourth grade on the recess. <laughs> but he, but it was based on me getting upset with my boys. And my boys were young then. And I go, no, you just sit there. I got to Harper. So I thought, well, Harper, well, I can't talk between lines. I can talk on them. <laughs> Right? By talking backwards. The director never knew what I was doing. He would, Sue Blue would say, don't go low on that one. I go, right. Okay, fine. I never told her. So I got the role. I got the role of uh, that, Vern Thompson, Baxter Stockman, and Vern, who was the assistant, Vern, the assistant to Vern. And I went to uh, Fred, and I said, I can't do all these. I can't do Vern, whatever. So he gave it to Pete Renaday, right? Who made us laugh more than anybody over the nine years. And I'm telling you, I sat next to the, the uh, Rob Paulson for nine years. That's more than Bonanza. That's more than any other movie or TV shows. It was a delight. And my whole job was to make Rob laugh. In fact, um, somewhere along the line, I, I, you know, it was easy the first year because we were kind of like, what the hell? You know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I thought to myself, this will never work. What a bad title. Okay. So it was a huge success the first year. We could do anything. The second year, it was like, ad-libs were like union arbitration. How about this? How about that? No, no, no. Okay. Right? And so, along the way, we got bored. Rob and I worked so many Bobby's World and commercials. We worked so much together. Why? 
he's a high tenor and I'm sort of a baritone. And that's the technical side. We thought the same. And so uh, I get a note from uh, Rob. He said, now my line is, uh, how would you like to be boiling oil? Or how would you like to be boiling oil? And he went, no, no. That was the uh, rehearsal. Then he wrote a little, ripped it off, and he gave me my ad lib. And I did it, and it went into the show. It was, how would you like to boil an oil with just a touch of cilantro? And it was like a, a victory. They let, let it go. And later, I got to tell you this, uh, Nikki and Wendy, uh, because it's the greatest moment of animation. And I, I did hundreds of shows, maybe thousands, but hundreds. We were doing Bobby's World with him, Howie Mandel. And I was cast as Walgard, you know, like the apes, right? And uh, Rob was a high guy like this. Same character. But he was high. Now, they made me the skinny guy on camera and made him the fat guy. They got it mixed up in Korea. They mess it up all the time. So they would get... Meeker and Smurd mixed up. Now, Howie loved ad libs. Howie Mandel. Do you know he's on the uh, judge on one of those shows? Bald headed now, right? So he, he would let it go. So Jim Fisher and Jim Stahl, the writers of the show, and they were from Second City, brilliant writers, came in, and uh, the director, Jenny McSwain, would say, Where's uh, Meeker and Smurd? And they were, we're not going to run it. They had lib anyway. Why bother? <laughs> oh. So we, we go on and we start to rehearse. Or I don't think Jenny had rehearses. I think you just told. They mixed up the characters again, meager and smurred. So my lines were smurds and vice versa, meager. Okay. So my ad libs, which I always write down. Right, as John Cleese would say, when they said, Are you ready, Mr. Cleese? He goes, Not quite. I'm not finished writing my ad libs down. <laughs> right? <laughs> so uh, I'm ready to go. And they change characters. And there's a rep way down, like 10 people beyond Tino Osana, beyond the other actors, Frank Welker. And he, they pass something up. And it gets to Frank Welker, who was a, he's a super star of all voiceover. And he starts to laugh and weep at the same time. Because Rob Polson had said, here's Pat's ad libs. <laughs> Where else in any performance would you get ad libs written down? <laughs> we exchanged ad libs because they're written them. For our sons. <laughs> is it well, it was like the moment where I went, oh Lord, there's no other medium of performance you could do that. Not stage, yeah. not in a movie. <laughs> oh, unbelievable. <laughs> Love that. I didn't answer the question, but I went off. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> like I said, we love hearing stories. So well. You're going to get them from me. <laughs> do you do anything special to get your voice ready before you record? No. Um, one thing that's good, short answer is no. <laughs> one thing that's good is try to s sing a Frankie Valley song. The Four Seasons. Don, you're a good, you walk like a man. <laughs> Not, not a big volume. Never use big volume. But slight volume is good for that. And then um, when there's tongue twisters, come on. When you have to move a house, and we've never done this, by the way. When you have to move a house, you should go to the gym and lift a little pad, you know, weights for about a week. And then move the house, no problem. Boxes, ha <laughs> ha. 
we don't do that. So we die the next day. But that's <laughs> what we should do. So stretching, getting ready a little, you know, and then forgive this. You know, the only muscle in your mouth is your tongue. So you have to stretch it out and put it back in and move it around. I'm not going to do that for you. It's really <laughs> scary. I don't have a big tongue, but everyone's tongue is too big. But, you know, oh, you know that's it. Forget tongue twisters. Rubber <laughs> baby, uh, red leather, yellow leather, red leather, yellow leather. You see my mouth is going, no. <laughs> Working around. The, the tongue works. So Frankie Valley and tongue, and you're ready. <laughs> I saw a Jack Angel who recently died. He went into an ADR session for uh, a Pixar movie, and uh, he did one line, and it was loud, and it was a rap. He was done. He hurt himself. I thought, don't ever do that. Never with volume. Yeah. Can you explain the process of voicing a character? Like, do you get the script first and then? Yeah. Well, there's three ways we get it. One is uh, you got it. You can do that. Two is you get a picture. And that's number one. Like with Fred Wolf and Ninja Turtles, they go, Casey Jones, here, here's a picture. And I look at it and go, well, what do I do? Just do a young please good. So I did that hello violator. So I did it and slash. It was like uh, he's crazy, but as you know, I look at it and he's got splayed teeth. So I thought, I'll do critic Douglas. Oh, splayed teeth. Like that. <laughs> right? So it's simple. It's like uh, it's not rocket surgery. And the other way is to think, and Phil Lamar is huge on this. He says, think about um, impressions. And then you bring up or down. But that's what he does. He listens to people, and he thinks of people, and he does them a little more than they usually do. And that's the basic way you get them. Also, uh, not also, but going back to a picture. That's what you get. And you know what? It's sort of like... Bob Dylan, you know, uh, like a Rolling Stone, his song, What's it a time? He threw a button at b -b -b dime, didn't you? You used to never compromise, right? He got that because he was he was reading a little poetry. He'd broken up with a girlfriend, and he'd just seen a Kurt Valberto Breck play. And that was like Pirate Jenny, boom, 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 German, right? He kind of thought, well, I'll write a song. Then he got really good people in the studio, and he had a typewriter. As Al Cooper said, it's the only time I heard a session with a typewriter in the background, a musician. And they just kind of created it. And I thought, you mean millions of dollars and a great career is based on creative? Yes. And, you know, sometimes you want to spend two hours saying, how'd you get slashed? Now, I looked at a picture and went, Kirk Douglas, which team? That's it. How'd you get uh, Casey Jones? And I made so much money, you know, thousands of dollars signing Casey Jones. It was a young Clint Eastwood, you know. So, and slap me if I say hello, Violator, again. That's <laughs> it. That was it. You know? <laughs> I'm sorry. I wish there were more to it. <laughs> You make it look easy. Yeah. You definitely yeah. do. I, well, you know, what? you get a plumber in and you get a problem with your toilet and he lifts his sister and top off and does something and goes, okay, it's good now. And uh, and you here's a hundred bucks. Yeah. You know, Bill. And I go, dude, 
you know, if they say, well, you got to do that and you got to do this, I go, look, can you do a 300 pound Scottish duck, duck with a lisp? <laughs> I say, I can't. If you want a Scottish duck with a lisp, I can do it. <laughs> they go, well, no, I can't. Okay, I can't do this. So that's the way it is. You want a duck? I can do it. You want a sister? You. I'm not going to say <laughs> I'm going to pay the bill. As far I as... It, I make it sound easy because I've done it for 50 years. Right. Yeah. And and you voiced over 4,000 characters? I don't know. Is that right? I lost count. Yeah. Yeah. Hundreds, hundreds of cartoons. And, with the, and Fred Wolf was cheap. Oh, he, we never had a guest for the first four years. We were always, that's what Rob Paulson can do, uh, rock steady or bebop. And uh, that was, that was Barry Gordon and Cam Clark. Now they could do nothing, but you know, Barry Gordon and Cam Clark, but you know, it's like you, what about the Chinese professor? That's you. I don't do a Chinese dialect you do now. That was it. And so we learned. And uh, Rob Paulson, who can sing like a bird, but he, he couldn't do characters. So when he got a big character, he'd do a kind of character like this. And it worked so perfectly. And that's how he learned how to do other characters in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. He's younger than I, by about five years. But brilliant. That's how we got along. And Cam Clark is your cousin, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. we it's Mormon, so we had a we shared a different woman. So uh, Lorenzo Dow Watson married one woman, had some kids. Then he married another woman, younger, I don't know, and had another. So that's how we uh, share. And my grandfather's half brother is William Hin, King Driggs. And that's where the King sisters came from. Because, you know, they didn't want to be known as the Driggs sisters. Ooh, that's a little rough. But that's how I camps my uh, nephew, but never get any competition. And the joke is, and he is so funny, Leonardo, who he played, is the straight turtle. His lines were, come on, guys, knock it off. We got to do something. And and uh, it was perfectly cast. Barry Gordon, who played Donatello, who's kind of the egghead nerd. He's an egghead nerd. I mean, the guy went through law school during the time we recorded. He had books and stuff like that. He's um, brilliant. And... Uh, Raphael is Rob Paulson. He's a smart aleck anyway. And uh, who am I thinking? Who am I forgetting? Donald Michelangelo. Hill. Michelangelo. Townsend Coleman. This is funny. Had kids at that time that were teenagers. Wow. So, dude, he knew. Cowbunga. <laughs> he knew all that stuff. So there you have it. And Pete Renaday, who was a little older than we are, still alive, he was brilliant and funny. Now, James Avery, good Shakespeare actor, but he was always like this, no matter what he did, right? He did Shakespeare, he was fine in San Diego. But so I thought, well, I, I can go like he did, and I won't interfere with him. And so we became known as the odd couple from outer space. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't sit with him. He was away in the front, but I loved him to death. I Were you him. ever interested in acting in movies, TV shows, live action type things? Yeah. You know, when I started, I was really theater trained. I did 50 plays. In fact, I went to Australia because an agent in New York, uh, Robert Redford's agent, Stark Hasseltine, get that for a name, Stark <laughs> Hasseltine, 
William Moore said, you know, you you look at my resume and go, you're a little light on Shakespeare. I went to Australia and I did. I, Othello and Coriolanus. And I was light on Shakespeare. So I, I was trained in theater because we had nothing else. There were no video whatsoever. It was theater. So uh, I thought when I got over there, well, I'll be a theater actor. Then uh, video was happening. I had little training because by the time I went to uh, Cornell, it was real to real black and white video. Come on. So I had no training whatsoever in video. So I did a movie, Picnic and Hang Your Rock, over there. And I did uh, a little this and that and TV and stuff. But God encouraged me to go into a voiceover. Because if you know, uh, and yeah, I'm sure you do, Nikki, TV and film, it's like bone real. Like as Judy McSwain, McSwain said, do what you want, but you got to be movie acting or prime timey, she used to call it. Well, that's hard for me, because I grew up exaggerating. As I told you, I, I grew up around my mom, obviously, who grew up around deaf schools. And the deaf are big when they were, I don't know, right? They're big. I grew up that way. My mom was big, so I grew up Encouraged to be exaggerated. Well, different journey for an actor to go, imagine you're doing a movie and they go, give me a little more. They were always going, Freddie, less, less. <laughs> and that's the way I, I turned out. So when I got to Australia and learned about animation, it was the area where they needed more. And I gave it to them. And I'm comfortable being stupid. I, I'm comfortable with it. <laughs> Where some actors, like I think about Tony Hopkins and some of these actors, they must die to be big and exaggerated. Not me. <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, you definitely picked the perfect career because you are amazing and. I can't tell you how great it is that you're here to hear you do these voices. It's just, it's, it's so awesome. Thank you so much. Well, I'm grateful to you for enjoying this. And, and I'm also grateful for God for leading you to this. But who knows what the process is, but I'm so grateful, Nikki and Wendy, to have this time to tell you and share these thoughts, some of which I've never shared before, but uh, it's been a delight. Well, we're not done yet. Wendy's got questions. <laughs> we oh, can't no. let, we can't just let done. you sit there and not Unless you need questions. to go. We can, we can, no, we, no. Are, we are capable of respecting your time if we try hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Here, thank you. <laughs> what, it, what would you like me to say? Oh, so you did already mention that you, as, as well as starting on the Scooby movie, you did then do voices in a lot of the series that had Scrappy-Doo. Now, Scrappy-Doo is kind of a polarizing character, even here on the panel. <laughs> Nikki and I do not agree on this. So it is kind of just, we need to ask anybody that's on, are you a Scrappy fan or are you not so hot on Scrappy? I don't care. <laughs> Listen, I, I told you I've done 200 shows on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I've seen sex. <laughs> I'm dude, you know, I was so busy making cartoons, I didn't watch them. I was on at one time eight hours a day in different cartoons. I, I didn't know. Frankly, I, I'm always a fan of everything, even the bad shows I do. Little Clowns of Happy Town, oh, the worst show ever. I actually heard two women say, I'm going to hug and I want one now. 
<laughs> oh lord it was so bad unfortunately i was a villain but i didn't have time to watch the show i i like scrappy dude because i was hired now i remember being in the booth with Doss butler and maybe don messick on either side these are the guys right and a Beyond the glass was Joe Barbera of Hanna Barbera. And he went, okay, Dawes, let me hear you do Sco uh, Scooby-Doo. And he went, oh, you, uh, what's his name? Yeah, Pat <laughs> for Bar Frawley, do it. He didn't even know my name. I didn't get the role. I think even Frank Walker got the role. I have no idea. But it was sort of like, you know, they, bear in mind, Casey Kasem started there, and he played Shaggy. He was doing a beatnik in 1969. They stopped in 59. But he was like, Shaggy, cool, cool. Had a little beard. <clears throat> Who knew? Then, he, oh, he's a beatnik? Really? Oh, wow. <laughs> So I was happy to get work. And some were good, some were bad, some were really ugly. Yeah. We had no control. You couldn't say, no, I don't think I want to do this series. It's not good. I know, bear in mind, I stopped auditioning for Adult Swim and other cartoons much later. But that's because of my uh, personal beliefs and what I should do. And wouldn't. I never dropped the F-bomb. I never was rude, I mean, really rude with language. I did a sketch show called uh, Off the Wall before Mad TV. So it was a little lighter than Off the Wall, but I would say to the director, I don't want to do that sketch. But I didn't do that. It, because in those days, animation was never, ever rude. Never. So I was home free. Not my plan. God. Yeah. Oh, no, my definitely... wife went to the church and said, should he be doing this? And she talked to somebody. She said, well, my, 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 my uh, husband sells liquor at a liquor store. But, and that kind of quelled it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Well, honestly, you you have brought so much joy to so many people and not even just children because, I mean, yeah, we were children once and that's how we got to know you, but we still enjoy all of those cartoons. Like we're, I know. We don't, have, we don't have all of this Scooby stuff because it was something from our past. We actively still watch and enjoy it. So you have made such a difference in literally millions of people's lives. I. If anybody has ever even suggested that it wasn't God that led you to do this, <laughs> they're full of it, okay? Yes. There's no, there's no question at all because you've brought nothing but something positive. And, like, I, I'm so happy right now that my hands are shaking. Like, yes, I can I'm, hear I'm, it. I'm, I'm I can adult. hear it in your voice. And but listen, Wendy... Um, I had no idea when I went to a theater that I would be, be doing cartoon voices. I had no idea. I had no plan. But when I was a boy, I never, by the way, I never wanted to be a cartoon guy. That's where God led me. I, I, I was capable of saying, well, you know, that's what it is. But I never thought, well, because I've been around the death because my mom was on the death, because I was encouraged to be exaggerated. I never thought that. But it's something that happened to me, and I loved cartoons as a kid. Loved them, and I feel the same way as you, Wendy. It was a delight. You know, it was like my time, and I remember going to uh, drive-ins with my mom, and it was like a black and white. I remember one night in Bainbridge Island in outside Seattle. We went to a movie and it was a uh, Gentleman's Agreement or some black and white Gregory Peck movie. 
And it was like, oh, shit, you know, forgive me. Uh, and But it started with a Woody Woodpecker cartoon. And I thought to myself, then, before cartoons, really, Saturday morning, I go, this is my time. And I love to watch Warner Brothers, Daffy Duck, and Bugs. That's my time. And I love that. You, yeah, well, maybe they were made so adults would kind of enjoy them, but my time. And animation should be a kid's time. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. yeah. We, we, um, I know that Nikki and I, at least, uh, we can't speak for everybody, but we are not big fans of what they have done with the Velma character recently and their uh. new show. Um, not, yeah. not appropriate. I, I just make well, it pretty you know, uh, it. we could get into politics and stuff, and but I think that uh, there's something about making things innocent and not, not getting into woke, not getting into this and that, but there's Fred, there's, you know, Shaggy, they're simple. Very simple and not complex, but I don't know. Yeah. I we've have said, no idea. We've said many times on the panel that, in our opinion anyway, Scooby has lasted as long as it has with such a huge fan base because the characters have been so generic. Yes. And it's just kids and their dog and they're out helping people and they're solving mysteries and there's nothing bad in it. One of our friends on the panel one time said that you know, Scooby was like a warm blanket. And that's what cartoon should be. That it's your Yes, it's your I agree. Blanket. I agree. And by the way, if you go to In and Out, do you have In and Out there or you don't? Not up here, no. Okay, in the East Coast, In and Out. If you want to get something for your dog or cat, what do you call it? It's called a Scooby snack. Oh. <laughs> it's a no salt. Patty. Now there's something oh. else that two patties with, with cheese called a flying Dutchman, but a Scooby snack. Come oh, on. That's I mean, that's where crazy. would you find a character like to eat besides Shaggy and Scooby? It's, and a dog, and I have Boston Terriers. They'll eat anything, <laughs> anytime, and especially if it's adult. If I got a plate, go on, get out of here. You just ate. No, I want what you had. But <laughs> it's so simple. A dog likes to eat, so does Shaggy. Yeah. Fred's straight. He's like a, he's boring. He's <laughs> like a boring guy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, the villains are villainous. Mm -hmm. They're not dark. They're just villains. Yes. They, they, uh, they, something to be said about simple archetypes yes. in the old environs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So do you have, I know this is a very specific question. Do you have any specific memories of any of the scrappy characters that you voiced, like on those, uh, the, the, the series that had scrappy in them? Um, and also just... Just in case maybe you know, you have like an uncredited role in an episode of Scooby-Doo called the Nutcracker Scoob, which <laughs> is very much a fan favorite because it's Christmas and it's Scooby. Do you remember what character you voiced in that? No, I don't remember <laughs> anything. But my favorite villain I ever did, I, the first one I did was the Blue Scarab. I'll teach you to meddle in my affairs. Oh. They always use the word meddle mm -hmm. in everything meddling right <laughs> but my favorite villain was an undersea water villain and my line was away the sea is mine <laughs> and they had me do it and then frank and i have to use my finger he did oh, <laughs> and they mixed them so it was like creepy and I thought, gee, I'm with Frank Walker. Cool. <laughs> that was my favorite. And uh, that's it. I don't know what I did with the Nutcracker. If I were in it, you know, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. 
So that was your favorite villain that you voiced. Would you say that that's your favorite overall character? Or do you have a favorite character that you ever in anything that you did that, that you were just like, that's, yes. that's the one for me? Yes. Uh, Disney's Tailspin, I play Wildcat. Blue is your intro banana. I forgot. Oh, look, there's a new icon on the map. No, that's guacamole. <laughs> <laughs> so they had this character, Wildcat, that was stupid. And I thought, well, and they were having a hard time casting him. And I thought, well, rather than stupid, let's make him naive. So I think it's Wildcat character. Yeah, I can. Uh, I did many episodes. Years later, I realized that the deaf had influenced me. Because in a state school, at least, there's no not people that are just deaf. There's something else going on. That's all they do. They dug with that tone like this. And they uh, you know, uh, kind of look crazy. You know, they dug. I got. So I got it from there. And I was cast. Now, Disney would never have cast me had they known I was playing a challenge to person. So 20 years later, I get a call from a psychologist in Corning, New York, or up there. And they said, well, would you take a call from a student? She's, uh, she's autistic, she said to me. I went, yeah. So I developed a relationship with a gal up in uh, upstate New York who's very on the spectrum and kind of like that, you know, very innocent sounding. And to this day, I talk to her on the phone and tell her I love her and she, here's what happened she would go to public school because they had the resources get off the bus be humiliated all day long come home and then she'd watch tv and see a challenged character who everyone loved everyone loved him they never said anything no jokes about him being this way or that way, because he put together an engine. He was, like, brilliant. And that's how she got to know who I was. And I want to tell you, Wendy, it's the most satisfying thing I ever did in my career. It's like Bob Hope. People would say, Bob Hope, he's not funny. Hey, he's out there making kids laugh, 15,000 of them in Tarawa, and 1,300 would die the next day if that's not import i don't know what is i i drew to understand that that hey look i'm in the amusement business and i'll muse in greek means not think well when you get somebody to think it's delightful and it it helps them yeah yeah definitely is there a voice that you found particularly challenging or just more difficult than all of the others? I can't think of one. No? I could only do what I could do. Uh, I had to play a female once, but I did this kind of thing, you know, with Rainbow Bright. No, not really. I can't. I don't think so. Okay. I do, do know that I did The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn on audiobooks. And I had 91 characters. Oh, and wow. that was a challenge to make them sound differently. Yes. But, you know, I, it was my best work because I was, I was, God raised me to do that. Yeah. And it's my best work ever. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So I have two props here for my next question. Uh, yeah. So in Filmation's Ghostbusters, you voiced Scared Stiff the Skeleton, <laughs> yeah. Ghost Buggy, and Jake Kong Jr. Yes, he was like a teenager. I yeah. can't do that anymore, but the Ghost Buggy, yeah. <laughs> no, why are you Perfect. Oh, are you talking to me? <laughs> I could do sounds of a car with a voice. Yeah. I love that. That was fun, yeah. but Jake, That's it's wonderful. gone. Yeah. That's a very underappreciated series, in my opinion. I really loved it, and I love all of Filmation's cartoons. How did your experience, seeing as how you worked both 
on a filmation show and you did a lot for Hanna-Barbera. How did your experience vary or was it pretty much the same? Were there any differences between the two studios? Yeah, filmation was like this role because they did everything in America. And so even the engineer didn't take numbers. He just like, we're wrong. And we would finish a full show in 20 minutes. Wow. It was four hours at Hanna-Barbera or other places. And they numbered things and they directed and stuff. They didn't direct, and just go ahead. In fact, they auditioned once, Lou Scheimer uh, had us come to the office like the third year. And he had a huge uh, list of characters. It was like a lawn sheet and designs of all these characters. And he had a cup of coffee and he goes, oh, oh Pat, now uh, what do you like to play here? I'm like, dude, are you kidding me? Well, I can do that one. I can't, I can't do that one. I, okay, that was it. And they paid in front, they paid a grand which is like five grand now mm -hmm. in advance. You do the role, you're done. 64. So it was like 150 grand or 120 grand right there. You knew, and that would be like 500,000 now, but you knew it. So, mm -hmm. you know, Paul, no problem, honey. You know, oh, stay a month in Hawaii. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> oh has the the process of voice acting changed very much in the 40-ish years that you've done it i don't know i don't think so i think the style within the genre of animation first of all there's many more genres of animation when we were kids even when you were a kid it was like Hey, D, wow, whoa, whoa. It was like one style, cartoon. Now, there's many cartoons. There's more subtle and better animation. And when Disney got into it in 83, it got much better. It was like a puppet show. It was on 14. They changed the cell every 14, you know, yeah. cells. And it was like half a minute, you know, like Scooby-Doo, right? Uh, right but so there's different styles um so you have to fit the style you have to be more subtle and more outrageous and it didn't get much more outrageous than yeah. Hannah Barbera with Tex Avery was even there as an old guy I loved him and uh Charlie Adler, Charlie Adler show is the only show I did uh, something in a dog or there was a show he did. He did both characters. I lost my voice. The only time ever in my entire career because I was screaming and yelling. Came <laughs> back the next day, but yeah. If there is one, what is a role that you maybe auditioned for? or you really wanted, but you didn't get it? I can't remember one. Well, that's good. That's actually, I'm glad, I'm glad that you answered like that. Yeah, that way I won't shoot myself when I get on the <laughs> internet up there. I don't, I, I can't think of something that bothers me because as I mentioned before, we had, I was so grateful and so, I don't know what the word is. I was so impressed by the fact that I worked. That was enough. You know, I got another cartoon show. I, I didn't think, you know, my wife never said, which cartoon? Or I didn't. I never got that attitude. Some actors did. They'd get angry when they got a crappy show or I didn't care. I, yeah, what's your point, Mokiana? <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> I guess I was thinking about the pool and my boys. <laughs> <laughs> and the month in Hawaii. <laughs> totally. I was like such a king. <laughs> yeah, well, you stay here. I got to go back and do Dinky the Duck. You stay here for another couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's great. I'm I'm glad that you're 
that you're happy and satisfied with what you got to do. Is there any dream project, even if it's not voice acting, is there anything that Rick, right now you're thinking, I'd really like to still do that? Well, I can't have screenplay. It's true that I haven't finished. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, uh, and uh, I wrote a book, but it didn't sell a dime. I mean, you know, it's like a joke. No, I don't think so. I'd love to teach. And so patfraley.com, there's free lessons. There's 30 of my home study courses. Uh, there's a lot of stuff on there. But they, there's like 50 free lessons on that site. And my, uh, the contacts is my home phone and my uh, email. And I, I'm available until I go to heaven. Then I'm not. <laughs> so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, you have mentioned Joe Barbera and obviously Dawes and, and Don Messick and all of these wonderful people. Yeah. Besides the ones that you've already mentioned, because well, I just I just want to listen to you talk some more, to be honest. Um, you you are a thousand percent a bona fide celebrity and a star. And I think that you are absolutely I know. you are right up there with all of those people that you have mentioned. Well, they're all and dead. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm the guy. That's why. So, you know, you, you're the guy. I'm the guy. Right. Yeah, okay. Definitely. Wendy, what do I sign and where? <laughs> <laughs> That's why it is. You know, I got in town and these guys were like 56. They're all dead. Alan Oppenheimer, who's in his 90s, is the only guy I, re I know that's still alive. Yeah. That's like uh, now. Okay. So he yeah. could be dead. Who knows? But uh, my dearest friend was Ed Asner, who died last year. And Ed, I loved hanging out with him. I, lo I loved him. He loved me. But I loved being around him and giving awards because you looked so good around a 90-year-old. <laughs> so I, I told uh, Renee, my wife, who I've been married to 44 years, known 50 years or more in uh, college, I said, I'm going to go to my dead agent's uh, memorial because Alan Uppenheim was with him. And, you know, he's 393. I look really good. And she goes, good idea. Do that. <laughs> and so I'll walk in there with this old guy with no hair. And I'll look really good. I want a day over 73. <laughs> You look good all on your own. You don't need to to be around anybody that's older. You look good, good all on your own. So I don't have to show you this rubber band in the back of my <laughs> neck to get everything like, well, hold on, wait. Is this on straight? Because sometimes it lights up. I'm good. Wait. <laughs> So tell yeah, me, I am. I, I do look good. You do look good. Yes, you, you do. do. And I yeah. wasn't yeah. joking about that Rod Stewart thing, too, because, I mean, he's got some of the best hair on the planet. and Totally. You, and he's like in his 80s. Pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah so uh, maybe I'll be dead tomorrow, but I look good now. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell me another bona fide starstruck moment that you've had in your career? where you met somebody or you worked with them oh. and you were just like, wow. Oh, I've worked with Barbara Streisand and, you know, uh, Rob Perlman and Mark Hamill. Mark Hamill wants to, I'll tell you this story. Mark Hamill loved the guy. I did a series with him and um, we went to get a Coke and Kathy Ireland, was with us now she's a she was a model and beautiful you know thick eyebrows gorgeous you know so she got a coke and she went back to the studio we were behind her well she had a cotton dress on which was the light was coming through 
you're going to need that go longer. <laughs> and Mark, who's been married to Betty Lou for years, his wife, he tapped me in the shoulder and goes, Pat, 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 uh, get behind, get in front of me. Okay, Kathy, get in front of me to uh, obfuscate his view, right? Yeah. Oh, right, good. <laughs> So I I uh, threw threw uh, myself in front, but uh, there's another thing, and this is not a little rude, okay? But I uh, watched China Beach, and Dana Delaney was in. You remember Dana Delaney, little yes. a brunette, wonderful mm -hmm. actress. Well, I got to the studio. She's teeny. I mean, if you took a wrist, you'd break it, right? Yeah. She's just teeny and beautiful. All, all the way down. Okay. So we go out to have a cup of coffee. And she's really demure, like Grace Kelly. And I sat down to her. And uh, my father went to Duke University. So he told me, write grammar. And, you know, it's not father, it's father, you know. And so I sat next to Dana. And I put my coffee cup down. I was nervous. And I said, well, Dana, um, why are you reared? Because you say reared to a human. You say raised to chickens. Why are you reared? And Dana said, in the back of a Buick. <laughs> and then she, uh, apparently I turned red as a beet because she grabbed my hand and, went, and she did this. <laughs> like, it's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. If you want to edit that out, you can, but that's the truth. That's oh, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. I oh, never I use that term again talking to a no. woman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Oh, I do one other one. Carol Channing was the biggest star I ever worked with on Adam's family. And she, uh, you know, Carol Channing, talk like that, and, you know, a blonde. And uh, we had to take pictures once, and she was an odd duck, by the way. She only ate fish and had water of, of a Pierce Arrow can. And that's an old uh, car, and they came with a flask, right? And so she came up and she she used to wear huge glasses and she put on her sunglasses and they were like this big and uh i went out there and smelled like a jackass and she turned to me and goes and i looked at her glasses and then she turned to me and whispered it's cheaper than surgery <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. She was a delight. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. She she uh uh fell asleep during one cat a uh, one show we did on the floor. And we had to wake her up because she was snoring. Oh my and, gosh. <laughs> in one show, and I wasn't in this, Jackson was the recording, and she was talking and doing this and moving because we all move when we work and Jackson said I'm sorry Miss Channing but I'm still hearing the blouse shuffle and she said oh thank you right she took her blouse off <laughs> and in her cotton bra cotton did the rest of the show oh my gosh <laughs> I wasn't there I would have like, died yeah <laughs> Oh my goodness. Oh, it's good to have good memories that you can laugh at. Oh, There's nothing better. <laughs> so many sessions were filled with laughter. I mean, when I first started, I was doing Justice League at Hannah Barbera. There was Danny Dark doing Superman. And he would be on a, he'd have a white uh, sweatshirt and white pants. He'd have a, convertible and a, a telephone in 79 in the car. I mean, he was wealthy and Danny Dark was known. He'd go, here I'm flying and I'm naked and I'm over a <laughs> volcano and it hurts me. 
And we would laugh and they'd take it out and put in, you know, he'd do it again. But every line was, there were so many outtakes. 50% yeah. were stupid things. Like uh, somebody would do a line and it was like not good. And I'd raise my hand. And I'm in the glass with 10 other actors. And uh, they go, yeah, Pat. And I'd say, let me take a swing in. And then that got a big laugh. <laughs> <laughs> but it was nothing but a delight. And it was a, and you know what? Rob Paulson, I got to tell you, is one of the greatest guys for this, too. Just in Peter Jason, the on camera actor, on camera sets. But they are such a delight to have for energy. Because I don't know if you thought, even if it's four hours, you're, you're starting up and starting down, starting up, starting down. You got to keep that same level. You gotta get up and uh rob would say something keep it going whatever and we were buoyed because i'm gonna tell you it was tough to keep up for a cartoon show sometimes because the producers didn't know what it was like right yeah were the outtakes recorded and is there a way for us no. to listen to them because that would just be great <laughs> There's no way that you can ever hear the outtakes. <laughs> yeah, they were private. We knew that too. So we would uh, be ridiculous, you know. <laughs> You've like completely like made our whole year probably. Oh, bless <laughs> you. Thank you for coming and talking to us because I, I can't stress enough what a huge part you have been in a lot of people's lives including ours and we love you so much for doing what you've been doing and that you have such a conviction and you've stuck to it and you're, you're appreciative and you're grateful and I really think that that shines through in your work I think you well you know that I'm so grateful to you for that because I really don't look at genetics I don't look at skills. Yeah, I've got those. And I've got the genetics. I've talked about my mom and the deaf and my my MFA from Cornell, you know, in acting. No. It's something beyond that that takes a person into what they do, no matter what they do. Hero of wood, drawer of water, voice of a duck. I don't know. I can't take credit. But I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for having the opportunity to affect people like Wendy and like Nikki. You know, I'm so uh, grateful for affecting you two and hundreds, if not thousands of other people. I'm grateful. And, you know, when I'm gone the next day, I, I'll have one day on Facebook. Oh, he's gone. Yeah, he died. Who cares? Who cares? It's not why I did it. And I met my family's needs in a creative way. By the way, my second born Harrison once, and I'm talking 20 years ago, was mad at me and said, you voice of her husband. Oh. <laughs> now, he could say that now and it would be better than then. I was making thousands of dollars oh on residuals gosh. and still working, but you voice of her husband. <laughs> my oh wife my and I just die over that. <laughs> <laughs> what did your kids think about you being a voice actor? They did they know. watch? They didn't know? No, my next door neighbor was Ed Asner. They were mad when they went to Blockbuster and saw him on a VHS and said, oh, go ahead. He's an actor. <laughs> they, they didn't like that because they'd go in there and play with his Emmys off the mantle and learn how to swim in his backyard. They didn't know he was an actor. They'd have Brad Garrett come over and Rob Paulson, who could sing like a bird and skate. I would go to the skating rink. He was like amazing. They thought everybody was like that. And later in life, they saw they they said, well, one of them said, I don't know, 
They said, well, we just thought you did funny voices back in the uh, bunkhouse. Yeah, you were in the bunkhouse going like this and that. Uh, we didn't know. So they didn't grow up in show business. Because uh, we could go to the store. No one knew what I looked like. That's a great thing about voiceover. I mean, can you imagine being a newscaster in a small... They get no money and everyone knows them. Oh, Lordy. And I have no, no query about people that Brad Pitt and Harrison Ford live in these places that are hidden. Oh, totally get it. Because you, I asked uh, one actor who got some notoriety at the time, Joe Montaigne, very good actor. I said, what's it like being famous and shit? You know, forgive me. And he said, well, people stop borrowing your lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought about it and I thought, oh, that's bad. <laughs> they, everyone in your entire life treats you slightly different. And that's what happens, but not me. Yeah. It was always like, get it yourself. <laughs> they can care less. Although I go to convention, you think I'm a demigod. You know, it's like they're shaking. Yeah. And your entire life is about calming people down. That's what your life becomes when you're a, a star. Right. Yeah. And uh, getting them to act normal. And so that's what happens at a convention, but it's okay because they're ADHD or autistic or on the spectrum. And I understand that because I have relatives and people, I've been around it a lot. So when they go, uh, who do you think you are? I go, well, what, what do you, what do you like? You know, I don't get umbrage and, and uh, that's another way God uses me is uh, I don't get upset at people that are on the spectrum. I've been around it a lot. I don't know. It's it's all good. Yeah. Well, I think that we don't have any more questions. And It's about six hours, right? <laughs> <laughs> this has been so amazing. Like, thank you so much for giving us yeah. your time and talking to us and doing voices and we just, we're so grateful to have you here. And my cheeks hurt from laughing so much. So. <laughs> well, I'll take that my cheeks hurt and I'll post it on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to use that like uh, Brett Garrett said, he's one of the most amazing characters or teachers I've ever had. Bring your wallet. <laughs> and also Gary Owens gave me a, a review he said that he's the most amazing character voice actor in the seat next to me <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm going to use um, that for Nikki Blake my cheeks hurt <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> I'm going to use the other part just that <laughs> oh, oh, you know, uh, Gary Owens also said something um, he said he has more talent in his middle finger than I have my little finger <laughs> <laughs> and now he's dead I can't use it but I love that <laughs> bring your wallet oh yeah. lord <laughs> I'm my best friend is Brad Garrett, the six foot eight comedian, mm -hmm. and has a place in uh, Vegas. But I loved him before he did Everyone Loves Raymond. I just, he's, I go, you're the funniest man alive. Now that Don Rickles is dead. <laughs> <laughs> and he agrees. <laughs> Have you done any stand-up comedy? Because you can totally pull that off. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I started my career thinking I would do it. But by the time I got down to L.A. and started working, I had a, a wife in a, in a living room. So I had the girl and the, 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 the place. So yeah. 
why do it? <laughs> I would, but it's more fun to be on the outside of that than the inside. Yeah. yeah. I'm with Larry David. I'd be on stage going, I don't like you. I'm leaving. <laughs> I would not be a good uh, stand-up comedian. Oh, Lord. We'll talk about a brutal life, right? Ooh. Yeah. And late at night? Lord. And uh, I'm fortunate. I didn't have to do it. I would. I would have. Yeah. If that was my end. I just, wanna, like, we just don't want you to leave, Pat. We just, I know. We just love you. It's, I'm going to be out here all night. <laughs> I was going to say, you can't, we're just going to have to leave this feet up indefinitely. For I the have rest a of great time. picture, by the way, of me holding a girl, like in our, my arms, a little girl. I mean, she was nine or 10 in front of a Scooby Doo picture. Nice. It was over at Nickelodeon. I should send it to you, Nikki. Yeah. Yeah. I, you'll That's love great. that picture. I have sunglasses on and she's cute. And- <laughs> front of scooby-doo because we were doing something over there with scooby-doo because yeah. it went from there to ted turner to warner brothers to nickelodeon i guess mm-hmm. i the last scooby-doo i did was at warner Brothers. so yeah it's so with the warner guy brothers. that did shaggy the uh the movie on camera guy he was cool he was better <laughs> than the case yeah yeah matthew <laughs> lillard yes he's really a wonderful actor and Casey Kasem was a dude, really? Are you kidding me? <laughs> so when I was in Australia learning about voiceover, and I was early on, before I'd done any cartoons, I listened to Casey Kasem. I thought he was 18. American Top 40. Hi, I'm Casey Kasem. I thought, oh, good. An American on the radio. And he was like, <laughs> what, 40? <laughs> I knew Adam West though I got to know him real well he went to the same college I did later or earlier his name was uh, West West Anderson he was part of the multi-million dollar wheat family he was Batman you know in Mm -hmm. the 60s and I would met him up by my ranch my family ranch up in Ketchum I know I went dude are you kidding me? And he lived up there. But I got to see him every so often. And I sneak up behind him when he was signing autographs. And I go, there's that naughty Anderson boy. <laughs> and he loved that. He was a good man. Enjoyable man. <laughs> but I've gotten to know a few of those. These uh, Rob Perlman, too. Got to know him really well. I don't know why. We just clicked and hung out. Yeah. Did you ever work with, or did you know um, John Stevenson? Yeah. Because he yeah, was he... in. We we've, we've talked about this recently, where I think Talk he was at. in every every single episode of Scooby in existence. <laughs> well, Frank Welker said John was the man when he got to town in '69 when he got into mm-hmm. animation. And John was funny because uh, once I did a commercial and I was supposed to be Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, do these to Lopa later, you know, and uh, Danny Mann was in the kind of cast. And I said, look, stop, stop, hold on. Danny does this better than I do. Let me take Danny's role and he can do Arnold Schwarzenegger. And John said, don't ever do that again. And uh, John had penciled, like, but he would put this in, he put makeup on and everything before he come in. Because his idea was never show, he was old school, he was 50s. Never show weakness, never show anything, just do your job and leave. And he was, he was a lovely man. But, hey, Top Cat, he was an officer total. And this is funny about Woke, you know. He was the Irish then. Now, it's getting to the point where I, Pat Fraley, who's Irish, Irish-American, won't be able to do an Irish character because I'm not Irish. Right. It's not about pretending. It's about being. Yeah. It's, that's where it's going. 
I never did an African American, but that you know is beyond. It's beyond that. It's beyond Asian. It's more like, are you Russian? Well, you can't do a Russian. But I love John Stevenson. What a what a star. And he looked normal. He was a good looking six foot two guy, but he would do silly voices. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. We I have, have kind of a I have kind of a dumb question. Yeah. What what do like voice actors? Questions. I can do answer those. What do voice actors do when they're sick? Oh, you pretend like you're not sick. And then if you have something like really bad, nasal or something, Neil Ross and I got, both of us that we shared, got hooked on Afrin. Now that's squeezing, the, yeah. getting clear. We yeah. took so much, we got hooked on it. That means if you don't take it, it swells. Right. We both got off it, you know, but it was not easy. I remember for me, it was not easy. Uh, we just do the best we can and we don't have problems, you know. Uh, one of the things about doing this is you're talking so much and ooh, using your lungs and oxygen, you don't get as sick as other people. Hmm. Uh, I can't remember when I was sick and couldn't work ever. Yeah. That is something I have always wondered. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. I, I don't know why. I think maybe the pressure is like uh, on-camera actors. They don't, they work all yeah. the time, no matter what. But I don't remember be, working and being sick. Yeah. Maybe it's in Frankie Valley and using my <laughs> tongue a lot alone in the car. Was, <laughs> I knew I'd be alone because when you do that you're you're in a car it doesn't matter you can't pretend like you're talking on a <laughs> right phone. right you can't go yeah Bob. Oh, i was talking about no it work. <laughs> <laughs> i don't share that on facebook about when uh people talk about tongue twisters i don't put anything in yeah i don't <laughs> say stretch your freaking tongue out no <laughs> no, I don't even say it. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> I made you laugh. That was my number one thing. I'm going to say something else, but I'm so grateful for your response. And I had a wonderful time. Oh, yes, we so really enjoyed it. More so not looking at questions and answering. You you had such wise questions and they fed into stuff. So that's good. We loved your answers. They were great. Yes. Nice well, long answers know, with stories and you don't yeah, have good you don't have good answers without good questions. That's <laughs> what it is. I've had some really kind of boring uh, podcasts because there were no questions. But you right. know, you know what's going on. And uh I got semi I thought, well gee, Scooby Doo a long time ago. What, fifty years or forty four, forty five years? But you know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter as long as you have impacted another human being's life. That's nice. Yeah. And you definitely have. And it is it is literally millions of people. Yes. <laughs> millions. Yeah, I'll have my day on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Rod Stewart will have two days, by the way. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay all right thank you so much we really appreciate you, you being here thank you thank you you bet adios okay. for now yeah god bye. bless you bye, bye god bless you <laughs> thank you for tuning in to another scooby panel i'm nikki blake from scoobyaddicts.com if you like these panels please subscribe to my channel for more great discussions a huge shout out to our patrons julie rosen ross from scoobyfan.net Scooby-Doo of Roblox, Ruth Elliott Hillsden, and Tage. If you would like to support the Scooby panel, please go to patreon.com slash scoobyaddicts. A very special thank you to voice actor and teacher Pat Fraley, and artist, blogger, and Scooby collector Wendy Bridge. Scooby panel is available in podcast form on most podcast platforms, 
or as a web series on YouTube. You can find Scooby Panel on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter as at Scooby Panel. Scooby and Shaggy were voiced by Scott Innes. Check out Scott's website, onescottshop.com. Scooby Addicts artwork by Will Davenport. Video editing by Nikki Blake. Music composed and performed by Bovine Nightmares. Please join us next time for another Scooby Panel.